without any further ado, let us begin our uh, plenary session titled Evolution of FDI, How Technology is Changing the Future of Productivity and Growth. And uh, please welcome the moderator for this session, Mr. David East from United Kingdom, Head of FDI and Economic Products from Bureau Van Dijk. Salaam alaikum. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is David East. Uh, I'll be the moderator for this next plenary session, which is looking at the evolution of FDI and how technology is changing the future of productivity and growth. I think this plenary session follows nicely on from the previous session, which was, again, very informative in terms of providing a bit more background around Industry 4.0. I'm joined today, whilst waiting for the, the, the name tags to still be put, aside, put into place, I'd like to quickly introduce all, each of our panelists uh, for this next plenary session. So first of all, on my far right or your left, we have Dr. Ross McKenzie, who is a futurist and expert authority in new economic business. He's the founder and CEO of the startup business plus a director and advisor for numerous company boards. He helps startups establish uh, firms transition to the new economy through business advisory, technology, and outsourcing services. Um, drawing on his expertise of what he calls the four new economy enablers, SMAC, uh, which stands for Social, Mobile, Analytics, and Cloud Technologies, and IRA, which stands for Artificial Intelligence, Robotics, Automation, and automation technologies, blockchain and fintech, his perspectives today on the how technology is changing the future of productivity and growth will be pertinent, particularly on the imperative that organization, their constituents, must continuously reinvent themselves if they are to stay ahead of this next wave of massive disruption, which is just starting to impact us globally. So welcome, Ross. Uh, next up, we've got Jake Zeller. Uh, Jake is the partner at AngelList, the world's largest platform for startup investing. I guess we're going to hear a lot about startups in the coming years. Uh, running uh, at the same time or running parallel with this particular event, we have the AIM Startup. And again, it's well worth you checking that out during your time here. AngelList is known for syndicating the seed round of Uber in 2010. As we just heard from Andreas, they're not currently within Germany, although much needed, uh, but they are doing tremendously well. Since then, AngelList has facilitated roughly $700 million of investment into early stage startups, including self-driving car startup Cruise, which was acquired by General Motors for $1 billion, and home selling startup Open Door. Additionally, Jake is a partner at Spearhead, a program that funds and mentors new angel investors. So welcome to Jake. Next to me, I'm joined by uh, Hussein Al Mahmoudi, who's the CEO of Sharjah Research and Development Technology and Innovation Park, and also CEO of the uh, American University of Sharjah Enterprises. Welcome. To my left, uh, or to your right, I'm joined here by Mario Simoli, who is the Director of Production, Productivity, and Management Division of the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, ECLAC. In 2004, he was appointed co-director with Giovanni Dossi and Joseph Stiglitz of two task force, Industrial Policy and Intellectual Property Rights Regimes for Development, which is an initiative for policy dialogue at Columbia University in New York. Wow. And finally, I'm joined by someone I think you, everyone pretty much well knows by now, uh, Henrik von Schiel who's the father of Industry 4.0, and is best known as a mastermind of the fourth industrial revolution which ignited the global theme of Industry 4.0 today. He's been named by the Financial Times as one of the leading authorities and business thinkers on competitiveness, and Henrik is one of the most influential board members around today. So, again, we've got an expert panel here of speakers. I would like to thank the organizers for helping to compile this expert panel for this next session. I think to start off with, I think there's been several key observations made over the past, past few panel sessions and, and during some of the keynote discussions as well. And most important one about how governments can, 
can face up to the, the challenges that Industry 4.0 presents is to invest in people. Investing in people and looking after your HR is king. And I think you know, that was a point that was made towards the end there by one of the panelists on the former session. What I'd like to do just very quickly though, I think most of us have heard extensively from, from Henrik in terms of what is Industry 4.0. What I would like to do is rather than kind of reinvent the wheel, which is something I think has been regularly referred to, is, is to really put into practical terms. So, Henrik, if you, if you may, what, can we just quickly describe again, but really in basic terms, what is Industry 4.0 and how is it changing the future as we know it today? So, Industry 4.0 is um technology revolution that happens in 17 pillars that are colliding together. It will have the effect, um, it's colliding together the digital world that we have today, which is mobile phone, um, internet, social media, big data, all these aspects into one. And then it's colliding the virtual world and then the physical world into one. Has a tremendous effect on the revolution is even bigger than what we think because it's a revolution that is driven on how we work. So I have a session on that tomorrow on the Workforce 4.0. It will have a revolution on how we interact with our governments. Um, it will have an interact, a, a change on how our economy works in terms of blockchain, in terms of artificial intelligence, how we trade, how we um, are trading on the market. It will have an effect on how the contracts between the countries are established. It will have an effect on how countries position themselves or companies position themselves to compete based on their capabilities. It will have a differentiation on every aspect on how we consume aspects in our life. So it's not just a small change, it's a very, very big change. And I just wanted to highlight this is a huge opportunity for the emerging market, a huge one. So the European, it started the fourth industrial revolution because of the need, the pressure on the GDP. That's where they're focused on manufacturing the beginning productivity. The real, real potential resides in delivering new solutions, new service models, new productivities towards them. This is a humongous opportunity that is there. The ability to capture it, that is a difficult thing. That requires a new way of thinking and a new way of um, the working. Okay, great. So, I mean, just to re recap on that point there, then you're saying this is basically a huge opportunity for yep. emerging markets. So no, don't just wait there to, to respond to what, what's been told. Exactly. Go out there and look at your, what, you know, what characteristics you have within your economy, within yep. your country and see if, see if you can find the opportunity before it's really been told. That is the opportunity. So get ahead of the game. Yes. Okay, great. And in terms of what are the underlying key drivers and growth of product, um, uh, key drivers of growth and productivity? What would you say those are? In growth and productivity, so, um, so in growth, so I would separate growth from productivity because the one is, is, for example, growth is you always talk about developing the business or developing a nation. So that's growth. Um, that's where you focus on innovation and that's focusing on new capabilities you don't have. So artificial intelligence, blockchain, depends on the industry you are in. Um, biometrics, neurotechnology, energy uh, the sources. This is a huge area depending on if you're in pharmaceutical, you will focus on something very different than when you're in manufacturing. Manufacturing, you would focus on um, robotics, uh, human to machine, machine to human. When you are, you would focus on IoT, co connectivity, and so on. When you're in healthcare, you would focus on something very, very different. You will focus on IoT and biometrics, neurotechnology. When you are in a, in, in a defense organization, you would focus, or tran transportation organization, you will focus on very different things. So it depends on where you stand on how you want to get ahead of the game. Sure, okay, great. J Jake, let's bring you into the conversation on, on this one here. From your experience, technological developments, is this a net positive or a net negative for society? It's a good question. I think it's a net positive, otherwise I wouldn't be doing it. 
but it's tough to determine because at least in terms of looking at jobs, jobs created, jobs being destroyed, uh, you need to look at the second order consequences which people typically don't do. So if you look at self-driving cars, for example, we invested in a company called Cruise Automation and they have a functional self-driving car and GM bought it for a billion dollars. And with Cruise, it's taking drivers off the road, right? Especially with Uber and Lyft, it's putting people and taxis out of business. But at the same time, you need to consider the impact of self-driving cars. So the way cities are formed right now is they all need to be located in a very specific area because of convenience. But with self-driving cars, you don't necessarily need that co-location. You could have cities popped up uh, in places that are a little bit more spread out than you would have commonly because of the convenience of having self-driving cars take you, to be take you between them. So if self-driving cars are successful, now we have new cities which means we have new jobs in construction, energy, infrastructure, uh, in connection with building them. So yes, we took drivers off the road, but we just took, uh, created a number of new jobs. So it's tough to say from that perspective in terms of creating jobs, destroying jobs, whether it's good or bad. What I do know for sure, uh, at least I believe for sure, is that income inequality is, gonna, is going to rise, and it's gonna rise on two levels. And we saw this happen with the Industrial Revolution. Number one, it's going to be within a society, the haves and the have-nots. We're going to have a class of people that I call the technology overlords, and these are the people who have the AI uh, and various disruptive technologies, and they're going to be able to leverage them, creating economic value, and the people within their societies who don't have them are going to be relatively worse off. And then it's also going to happen between societies. So you're going to see that the countries that lead in the development of these types of technologies are going to be the ones that are more advanced, and the ones that don't are going to be comparatively poorer. So uh, going back to what Henrik was saying about emerging markets, I do think there's a really interesting opportunity right now. I spend a lot of time in India. I find it fascinating. Everyone has mobile phones. And this isn't something that was true 10 years ago. So yes, you can be very productive. You can build value. Um, but at the same time, if you don't have the most sophisticated technology that, say, the US or China or Russia has, it's a real existential risk to the success of your economy. Henry, would you agree with that? I mean, just based on the discussion we had this morning, I think you had a slightly different take on positive, negative impact on society. So I actually think, that because the core of the industry for that Sarah is human beings and yeah. it's the ability to adapt, so it's the ability to adapt to it. Just think about the fourth industrial revolution, like it's a larvae that becomes to um, um, butterfly. I think it's called butterfly, right? Mm -hmm. but when, when it's a butterfly, the, the morphews between these two aspects, it's still the same thing. It just has different characteristics. So we are merging. We are already becoming a butterfly, even though the butterfly doesn't look into the mirror and just thinks it's still, still crawling around. It's a butterfly. So, and um, just, just to give you, if you want to hear a practical example, so yeah. because it's about human beings, I mean, like, I have a couple of companies that are quite successful and I have, I have my son and he wanted to work for me because, and I'm unfortunately a person with a very big shadow, <laughs> and how do you grow the next generation up that takes this and really grow up under the shadow? So I decided, him, I decided to give him the most biggest business I have, which is an artificial trading business, and say this is the money printing machine I have. Why don't I give it to you? Why don't you learn something about semantics, ontology, artificial intelligence, patterns, algorithms, something which was three years ago totally new to him. Today, he has morphed into an, a totally nerdy guy that is very in detail into, into semantic, and, 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 um, and semantic analysis, complexity, um, complications on, on, on semantics, on ontologies, very, very advanced. So he can do something that I would not be able to do. So I, I believe part of this skill set is saying the skills in human beings is not the skill is important. It's the mindset that is important. His ability to learn is also his, his ability to learn is his ability to adapt. His ability to have a mindset is his ability to go from A to B. So you who are sitting here, your ability to go one step ahead, instead of, of consuming, you can also be part of setting the agenda. Part of this is it creates the opportunity with the fourth industrial revolution. If you have the right mindset, 
you can change and adapt and set your own paradigms to it. These opportunities are very rare in a lifetime. I don't think this will come again in your lifetime. The next five years are a humongous chance in your life where you can say, good, I want to re-educate myself. I want to reset my mindset. I want to do this. I want to do that. The opportunity is now. This is really, really big for all of us that are sitting here. Now I'm shutting up. <laughs> no, thank you for that. I think that's a very good point. I think the fact that we have to continually look to adapt and to evolve and to take new things on board. Um, Ross, how are you seeing, I mean, we, we're just now talking about the impact on the workforce. How are you seeing this being impacted by the increased use of automation robotics? Thank you, David. Uh, well, 12 months ago we were here and we had the conversation around automation, uh, AI, and what a lot of uh, progress, what a lot of development in just 12 months. Uh, so I'm going to share some insights from a business perspective, practical, like, perhaps, ideas from what my companies have been doing uh, in this challenge. So I run several companies, outsourcing technology. We have operations in India, and we our marketplace is a global marketplace. I also run a, another company, it's an e-commerce platform uh, in fair trade. So there's a couple of ideas that have sort of bubbled out from those ones. Now, it wasn't necessarily led by us. It was led by our clients, because our clients started to ask some questions, and they were tough questions. A corporate, uh, that corporate client we have in Australia uh, wanted to know what we were doing in robotic process automation. Up to now, we were a low arbitrage uh, outsourcing company uh, in India, uh, providing sort of back office, front office type work. So what I realise is that if I don't address this challenge of this emerging technology, uh, I won't have a business. Uh, and if we didn't start this 12 months ago, uh, where we were today, we may not be in business because it's just moving so rapidly. So what we did as a company, uh, we realized that we needed to invest in RPA, robotic process automation. So these are some of the buzzwords we hear around artificial intelligence. And um, we started to invest in these areas. Now here's the thing, and this is a very important point. Uh, I believe we are living in some really exciting times, but there are also some challenging times. But in terms of technology, and I want to try to speak in terms of emerging countries. Because it's all very well saying Australia or the US or, or Europe investing all these technologies and, and having, because you have a lot of that available to you, whether it's research houses or large corporations. But if you're in Bangladesh, if you're in Vietnam, even if you're in India, uh, you have some challenges of accessing some of these resources. But technology today, and let's just talk robotic process automation and other platforms like cloud and data, these are becoming very affordable. Mm -hmm. So in our operations, we run in Bangalore and India and Kerala, uh, we have cloud-based RPA, cloud-based robotic process automation that we are accessing, fairly affordable, and now we're combining that with our outsourcing services. And we're providing uh, business uh, to clients where for us it's taken a few hits on uh, what, who we employ, and I'll come to that in a moment, but uh, we've reduced the monthly invoice value to certain clients by 50%. Our clients are going, fantastic, we love that. Uh, that's taken a hit on revenue, but if we didn't take these uh, uh, hard decisions, our business wouldn't be around in a year or two years. So we've had to sort of modify that in ourselves. But also, uh, uh, Henry, we had a conversation earlier this morning uh, around attracting staff. So that's very important to us because we're a smaller company. A lot of our staff go to companies like the IBMs, the Infosys, the TCSs and what have you, the big, the big powerhouses in outsourcing. But we're able to turn that around because we're implementing some really cool technology. We're opening up new uh, pathways for learning and growth for our staff. So, the uh, great news is now we're attracting staff where before they would have gone across to another logo. So they're just some of the areas. Where we're looking at blockchain in our fair trade e-commerce. 
because the challenge, and this is the very important, blockchain may not be the solution for your business. You've got to ask that first question, what's the big problem you're trying to address? Mm -hmm. So in our fair trade e-commerce platform, we wanted to ensure that we had providence, that if people in Europe, people in Australia were buying our fair trade products, they were actually coming from Kenya and they were going, coming from actual communities in, in say, Nepal. So we're now looking at how we can actually utilise blockchain technologies from a supply chain point of view and be able to provide those out. So they're just some of the areas where we're addressing right now. And uh, perhaps uh, we can expand on that uh, a little bit further. No, th thank you, Ross. I think you know, the, the points you're making there are really good ones. I think first and foremost, you know, we look at this. I think retaining staff is, is one of the key areas right now facing most businesses. It's just, you know, they always tend to particularly emerging markets, go towards the bigger brands. What are you doing specifically to make sure you retain that? What, what areas, yeah. what, what bits of advice can you give that might help you know, smaller size organizations retain and invest in their talent? Well, well firstly, uh, I guess I'm biased towards a traditional educational path. I've gone through undergraduate, postgraduate, and then in doctoral level. So, so I do like that uh, form of education. Uh, but today we're living in a world where um, a two-minute YouTube clip, you know, we, we get it done, we learn and figure out, and particularly the uh, younger employees in my company, that's what we're learning. So uh, when we talk about RPA, where uh, one of our partners is UAPATH, uh, and our um, junior staff, who actually undergraduates, so they, they were not significant years of postgraduate, undergraduate uh, education, business studies, commerce, what have you, uh, we're also training them, partnering with UAPATH, uh, to actually become engineers in robotic process automation. They're not going back to school for three or four years. They're working on site in our premises, live streaming videos, doing training courses, and actually becoming certified. So for us, that's really affordable because UAPATH wants us to continue to use UAPATH. We're also using other technologies as well. But they've enabled us a, I guess, an ecosystem of education for our younger staff. And again, attract and retain, it's very important they're seeing a career pathway. They're seeing a company that's actually investing in the future. Uh, when it comes to blockchain, I explained that. Um, we're, we're playing with uh, crypto and digital currency. I'm, a, I'm an ex-banker, so I'm biased towards centralised systems. So I had to go through a learning curve myself. But we're actually doing a little trial on actually uh, digital currency mining. Um, won't go into the detail there, but we're not doing it to make money. We're just doing it to, to learn how mining actually works. Resource heavy, but uh, we're learning that because these are the sort of conversations we need to have with our clients. And if our clients aren't asking us, we need to actually start those conversations with our clients. And that's how we continue to provide value and remain relevant, frankly. That's what we're doing. No, fantastic. I think that's a really good point. Let me just turn this conversation right now from an academic perspective. I think um, Hussein, if we look at this from a UAE perspective, um, obviously with your role uh, within the American University of Sharjah, there was quite a lot of investment going in there in terms of providing a platform or to develop an ecosystem. Of, of graduates within certain technologies and so on. Can you elaborate a bit more about that, about how the UAE is stepping up to this challenge of Industry 4.0? Thank you very much. So the, the, the UAE as a country uh, developed an innovation strategy a few years back. And the whole background of this strategy is to uh, develop uh, an economy uh, for post-oil. So, as Highness Sheikh Mohammed, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, spoke three years ago about the idea that when we export the last barrel of oil, in some countries they will cry, but we want to celebrate that day when we export the last barrel of oil. And the answer to this is really knowledge economy. So the country did very well in the past 46, developing the infrastructure, developing, developing a good reputation, developing network of relationship with the, with, with the whole world, and of course taking advantage of the hydro, hydro, hydrocarbon uh, resources that, that UAE uh, enjoyed. But we also developed companies like Emirates Airline, Dubal, uh, Bia and Sharjah, Gulf Tainers, and other companies. So the mandate and the agenda of the government of UAE now is to embark on 
uh, knowledge economy, and to do that, the government created various initiatives. One, for example, we are probably the only country in the world that has a minister dedicated for artificial intelligence now. In addition to that, of course, the, the, the country and the different cities in the UAE uh, is playing their own part to, to, to support this overall vision. Uh, when it comes to uh, UAE, I like to do an analogy with the United States. So here is, uh, is, 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 is the case. When you think about Washington, D.C., think about Abu Dhabi. So the upstream, the capital, the power, the political power sits there. You go one level down, when you think about New York, the tourism and the finance, you think about Dubai, the finance, the tourism, the logistics. You go one level down, you think about Boston, Harvard, the MIT, the culture, the art. Think about Sharjah. Sharjah has pretty much almost 50% of the higher education students in the UAE. We have a university city in Sharjah which has 47,000 students, 2,000 PhDs. These being developed over the past year, 20 years and grown organically. We pride ourselves of having universities like the American University of Sharjah, which is one of the best universities across this region. So the government of Sharjah, two years ago, decided to transform the uh, education system from teaching only into research and development institutions. And to do that, we embarked on three main initiatives. One, the government allocated $800 million for the next five years to, de to do these transformation within the universities. So as we speak now, we have introduced new PhDs programs. These PhD programs mimic global trend, regional trends, and local needs as well. So you, we have a program in IoT and Smart City. We have a program on material science. We have a program in bioengineering and a program on Gulf Marine. So these are four PhD program, uh, programs I'm talking about, the, uh, the university I represent, AUS. Of course, we have a bigger uh, sister university, which is the University of Sharjah, which has 15,000 students, the biggest in the UAE. So, so that's one path that we are talking. Of course, this university transformation, in addition to these PhD programs, we are hiring, uh, we have a chief research officer now, which, which, uh, which, which is handling this. We have. Uh, upgrading, uh, you know, our own technologies, you know, by supercomputers and other things. So there is a there is a, a significant work happening within the university, and and to transform the university. To complement that, the government also created Sharjah Research Technology and Innovation Park, and the whole role of this park is to be the platform for, for commercialization and the platform to enforce this triple helix uh, triple helix approach, where we bring government, private sector, and academia together. This is not only for local or regional, this is a global uh, project that we have going on at the moment and we're working with countries from Finland to China to India to US, all over the world. So that's another a second initiative that we are embarking on. And the third initiative is the American University of Sharjah Enterprise, which is really the investment arm where we basically help facilitate the implementation of, of some of the, of, the, of the projects with focus on around enterprise creation. So, during the previous session and the session, uh, my colleagues here talked about, about the role, of course, of education. I believe it's the key. It's all about education going forward. It's the whole ecosystem. If we look at, for example, Silicon Valley, it thrives around Stanford. If we look at pockets in China or India or, 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 or Europe, universities are key. And in the UAE, we realize that this is the way forward, and that's why the governments are investing a lot and upgrading these universities and changing the mindset of the university that they are only teaching. They are not. They have to be able to understand how business get conducted and they have to give us students that are entrepreneurs that they, say they can think, you know, 360 degrees. It's not only about education. So that's, that's how we are approaching uh, our, our, you know, you know, you, you know innovation in, this, in, 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 in the UAE. Uh, uh, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's my answer. No, I, th I think there's a really good lesson to be learned from that one there, and I think that really pulls on to something I wanted to touch on later on the, the discussion, which is around multi-stakeholder collaborations. Um, I think the role of the university these days cannot be underplayed, particularly in, in, in FDI attraction. You need to have a sound basis of collaboration between the local uh, education system and obviously bringing that together with the government and also with the private sector to make sure that the correct resources are in place. I think the UAE, sorry. Yeah. 
Just if I may, I think uh, Henrik in the previous session talked about you know, understanding your local uh, environment and understanding your local competitiveness. It's very important. You know, we have, we have a lot of, uh, what, what's the right word? A lot of talks about everything, and you really get confused as a decision maker on, 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 on what to do. I think you ha we have to implement logic. You know, the logic of, of, of you know, you know of, of economy. And I think it's very, very important that you understand your local characteristics and environment. Even in the UAE, which is one city, or one, one country, you know, my environment in Sharjah is different than Dubai. It's different than Abu Dhabi. So we ha you have to be able to understand where can you play and what can you bring to the table and what value proposition you have. And you nurture those value propositions based on this. The, I, I tell my, my, my friends and my oh, people I work, the one million dollar questions I've been busy with over the past two years is really identifying a model that can work in Sharjah. And I think that's really what makes this, will be, what will make this successful. I cannot implement and cut and paste what's happening in Germany or in the US or in China or India because it's a completely different environment, social-wise, economic-wise, political-wise, people-wise, culture-wise. I cannot. So I have to come up with my own model that will give me the, my, my results. No, I think, as I said, I think that's a really good point we're making there in terms of understanding you know, the local characteristics, the benefits of what your local ecosystem has to offer. Um, I'd like to take this conversation around to Mario um, from, from ECLAC. ECLAC recently published a report um, that highlights that global FDI flows are returned to advanced countries. Obviously, this has not been driven purely politically. You know, there's other reasons behind that as well, such as capacity, strategic assets, R&D, spend, value-added manufacturing, and again, universities. From a Latin American perspective, what does this mean from an FDI strategy perspective? Thanks very much. Uh, um, yes, there is a process, uh, and particularly there is an enormous tension on FDI. Uh, if you look at what's happened today in Mexico, or what you happened in Central America with the new policies around the world about trade, uh, attraction of FDI, the process is is changing, tension is changing, and flows are changing too. And uh, there, there is an important point because uh, um, there is, and uh, we have to recognize that uh, not is massive, but there is a process of reshoring many times of investment. In particular, reshoring in, in particular industry that have to do with a new manufacturing, four point oh, whatever you want to call that, but uh, that is happened. And uh, we, we think that uh, it is important to, to take in, in, into action a new policy by government. And we say before that uh, this technology is a technology where we have an enormous complementarity between digital, physical, platforms, new business model, and so on and so on. This is good. And however, also, when we think of this technology like that, we have to rethink about policy. We can't maintain the same type of policy that country need to attract FDI. Have to change completely. For example, you can have very good educated people, and, and, and the people is going to be educated in, in different function, but they have the skills. That is different. Second one, you have educated people, have a skill, but you don't have platforms to ICT. Third one, you have educated people to have platform and you, you have any regulation about cloud computing. Now, you, you think that it's a new type of policy. You need good university, a good experimental and good practical uh, creation of a skill. You need platforms, you need regulation, you need to understand also how to implement policy on this way. Because when this type of industry arrives, and uh, the tax policy and welfare policy for the work and working in this industry is changing completely. Skills, jobs is changing, mention is changing completely. Now, the problem is that many times countries don't have the capability to read this new scenario. And they think, rethinking, every time we rethink about in the, uh, FDI in the same way. Now, it's not changing. You say the skilled people, good, you can have very educated skilled people, but you don't have, uh, you, your platform of ICT, the platform of ICT is 2G. What do you want to do with 2G? 
to produce with this industry, you need 5G. How you don't create the 5G, you can implement nothing about this type of industry. You understand what is happening? Now, it's, it's a complementary policy. Don't create the illusion that everything that you propose in this thing, because you use the right word, is coming. No. You have to rethink about policy completely. And I want to what we put clearly in our document is we, you need to rethink policy. You need a new way of complementary policy. Have to do skills, but new type skills. Not only millennials, we need good engineers also. Second one, we need skill formation, but we need platforms. Without platforms, doesn't work, but not every type of platform. Platform where this type of technology can be implemented, what FD investment can be connected with the other part of the world immediately. Third one, we need also trade facilitation. Trade is not more trade with the containers, you know. Trade is becoming by bite. It's coming, you know, the processes. You can see it's an intangible process. Now, we want to say about that, that many times we won't discuss this, right? we use the same policy about to attract investment. But it's changed completely. And many times government can understand and rethink in these processes in the old way. Come on, please, don't do that. Rethink about what is coming completely. If his son is speaking in another different way, but it's not only his son, his son to play with the, wherever his station needs a very good, strong communication and facility. Now, our, ten, our, our, our issue is, Yes, of course, there is some process of tension about reassuring investment, that is true. But we need to rethink about policy in emerging economies. And this policy has to be, I think, the best complementary policy. Have to do with skills, education, platforms, uh, and regulation. For we need a new regulation about data, privacy, and so on. We can speak about the industry, what happened recently with Facebook. We need also to rethink about what is security and how the industry wants to maintain intellectual property. I think uh, when we speak about that, we need governments with the enormous capability to rethink at the new world. And many times we don't have that capability. We don't put clearly, we don't, don't want to make the force on that. No, I think that, again, this is actually something that I think Henrik mentioned in one of his earlier sessions about the, the opportunity really for emerging markets is around their ability to adapt policy. Do you want to just shed some light a bit more on that one there and give us a bit more of your, your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, like, when you look at an ecosystem that is there in a normal country that we live in, we have a government, we have the citizens, we have the business world, and we have the financial institutions. The government are based on votes, they consume tax. The government actually, they give out directions to the financial policies, to the business world policies, so they decide on how the financial regulations are, how we can trade, how we can invest. They also decide on how business can act or react. I mean, like in Europe, we are, we are in handcuffs with the MIFIF 2. We are in handcuffs. It's minimum ability to really be flexible. We are hardwired. We are betoned. I mean, like we we cannot move. This is this is no no little joke. So this is where you have the ability to say the government is responsibility is for the social aspects to create jobs via jobs here, but in Europe and in the U.S. The social system is breaking at the rate never seen before. The government cannot maintain the high level of tax, the high level of services, so they somehow need to outsource it. They somehow need to outsource it. They need radically to change their policies because the business world is looking and saying, okay, one second, I'm paying that much tax here why am I not just moving to Ireland or to Switzerland or to UEE, right? Education systems that they are responsible to support via businesses, you can get an ed education in UEE. My son can enroll in any education that he wants because it's global. The financial market with blockchain is crumbling. It's literally crumbling. Normally a government has the one grip on power they have the central bank, 
they have their own money printing machine. Whatever they want, they just print the money and suddenly this is crumbling. So this, is, this ecosystem is moving. So when you look at the forces that are being forced, this is a force that creates opportunity because all these pillars that are normally hardwired for years, they're suddenly moving and they're moving. And the only element, the only power a government has is policies or investment. The only element that a citizen has, he's, he's suddenly not bound to a government that says, oh, I have to do it right here. The businesses are not bound to it anymore. So the paradigms are shifting. They are shifting very radically. Okay, Mario, what's your response to that? I mean, look, you're talking about policy change and even Latin America I agree and so with, on. I agree completely with what he said. It's, it's in the same way. When you, in, 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 the, in the ecosystem that you have, you need to rethink everything about that. Take, for example, the case of pri privacy, security, uh, welfare, Take the case of uh, tax policy. Everything is changing the way to it. You, you use an Uber, okay, use an Uber, but who pay the taxes? Who use the welfare? Who pay the pension of the driver? You know, the model, the pattern is completely changing. We need another way to rethink the interaction of the economy. It's the, uh, it's the ecosystem that is completely different. I agree completely with that. But if we put attention of FDI attraction, we need also there to change completely. We can't rethink in the same way. It's not only to have, you, you have the possibility to pay taxes in that region or that region. It's completely changing. We need an articulated, complementary policy where we have infrastructure, ICT. We need 5G. 5G does mean to have strong connection, okay, for mobility. Because you, do, you, do, you speak a lot of this industry. But if you don't have 5G or now rethinking at 6G, we don't have no possibility to have industry 4.0. No way, no way. That is, it's important to understand that. It's, it's a crucial point. And this, you need a platform. You need to regulate it. You need firms. You need to transform that. First one. Second one, people have to use that skills. It's the same skill that we have 30 years. No, it's completely different. Another skill, completely different. Third one, regulation. Because if firms arrive there, firms want to maintain privacy, intellectual property. The pattern is changing. It's changing the society, ecosystem. But the attraction processes have to transform in complementary policy that have skill, infrastructure in ICT, regulation, and uh, action for uh, more interaction between um, public and private sector. No, fantastic. Jake, that, that brings me on to my next question to you. What, what's your take in terms of how societies can prepare themselves uh, for this and what role governments and companies can play in doing that? Yeah, well, Hussein touched on it very well. I think education is the most important thing. Uh, you're either building technology and going out and participating in this or you're going to be disrupted. So unless you have strong technology, I think you're going to have big issues. So I think this could be done at the public level. I've also seen a number of really interesting private companies uh, that are tackling education. One of my favorite companies in the world is called Andela. Uh, they're based in Lagos, Nigeria, and I think they have operations all throughout Africa. And what they do is they find the smartest people on the continent, the 1% of the 1% and they turn them into software developers. And these people work on contract for companies like Google and Facebook, and they're doing extremely well. Uh, it would be really interesting to see that model replicated. There's a company in the States called Insight Data Science. What they do is they take postdoctoral fellows, so people who say have PhDs in uh, some type of engineering, a mathematical science, but they don't have specific data science experience. They train them, they become data scientists, and then they go work for Silicon Valley companies and companies more broadly. Uh, these are both private companies. They don't get any government subsidies, don't have any formal relation, uh, but they're doing an extremely good job educating people uh, and making a difference. So I think education is number one. I think there are some things that governments can be doing outside of education itself to help prepare pe people. And specifically, I think the part of the economy that you need to focus on is non-tradable, non-routine jobs. So non-tradable can't be exported somewhere else. Non-routine, it can't be automated. So if you look at things like nurses, plumbers, carpenters, these are jobs that are going to be around for a while. So 
as parts of the population uh, lose jobs to automation, you're going to want to find the gaps in the non-tradable, non-routine ones where you could bring them in. No, that's a good point. Um, Ross, do you want to add anything more to that one there in terms of the multi-stakeholder approach towards, you know, preparing ourselves, future-proofing mm. ourselves even? Okay. So my view is, and we've got a lot of different nationalities here today, and I'm going to make a big claim. If you can provide me with stable internet connection, 5G would be nice, 4G, 3 upload, 3 download megabytes. I'm not asking too much, just that. That's what this Wi-Fi is providing us in this venue right now. So if you give me that, if you can provide me with resources, perhaps people have just left school, they've got good understanding of what we call STEM, science, technology, engineering, maths, and a bit of history and a bit of philosophy, because that helps with ethical decision making, but just not even undergraduates. I could set up centres, operations, and we could start to build businesses to provide globally. Well, that's a big claim, but I know we can do that. It needs to be, there's some caveats, stable governments, attractive investment. So if it's a, an environment which is not safe, not secure, that wouldn't work. But we can provide services globally. And to help that, so that's what business can do, not necessarily without any government support right now. Business can partner. My company, again, we're not a big company. We partner with Microsoft. <clears throat> Microsoft opens up doors for us. Microsoft sees uh, an opportunity to work with companies <clears throat> like us because we represent a certain demographic. So we've got a great relationship with Microsoft. And uh, I would encourage you to talk to companies like that. Also, in terms of collaboration, one of the things we do in Kerala, uh, we work closely with the Kerala startup. So there's incubators, they attract business together. So that is a sort of statutory government uh, type organisation. So in your own countries, if you have these associations to attract uh, uh, businesses, like what we've got the Startup Fest uh, here uh, during this conference, is important. Uh, in my own country, in Australia, uh, we created co-working spaces because I want to bring business into my eco ecosystem, because that's what we do, we provide services. So I thought, what if I create an environment to actually bring other startups in? They may just want my space, but maybe they want our services. So we did that in Australia, in Sydney, a co-working space. Uh, we do that in India. We've done that in other uh, areas. Then what we found is then various governments wanted to have a piece of that. They wanted to step in. They wanted to help us. So we, I think, from a business perspective, we took a more of a leading role, uh, but we networked, we reached out, we told biz uh, governments what we were doing, local governments, national governments what we are doing. One of the reasons why I'm here, again, to build uh, networks, that's very important. It won't happen if you stay at home and you don't connect, so you've got to do these things. But it can be done. It's not, don't, don't get caught away in all this technology or if you missed the boat. Don't get carried away and think, oh, what's blockchain? What's all this about? We've missed the boat. You can do that right now. It doesn't, it's not a big step. And again, as I talked about earlier about technology and learning and education, the, 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 the model's changed. It's not about years of doing doctoral research these days. Yes, that helps, but a lot of the jobs and opportunities today, people can learn with basic education, can learn, and that can happen in India, it can happen in Bangladesh, it can happen in Vietnam, it can happen to Africa. No, I think that's a very optimistic outlook, and I think that's exactly the type of outlook that people need to have today more so than ever, I think, particularly to meet these challenges that, you know, we talk about Industry 4.0, I think uh, one of the panelists on the previous panel said Industry X.0 is continuously evolving. You know, there's no point in sitting down thinking about preparing yourself for today's cha challenge, it's about preparing yourself for tomorrow's challenge. And then after and after and after, it's going to continue to evolve and evolve very, very quickly. I'm conscious of time, and I want to open up the floor for a few questions towards the end there. But I think I'd be very keen just to kind of get a quick summary, or in one sentence, what is the key action points for the audience to take home with them? This is not about us lecturing to you. Yes, we've got a fantastic, you know, world-class panel of speakers up here, but we don't want to be coming across as lecturing. We want to, this is about sharing ideas. So 
just very quickly, what, I'll start with, with Henrik on, on, on my left and then work myself across the panel here, but what, what are the kind of key action points that you would take home from this, this, this particular session? What can you know, governments in this room or organizations in this room take home with them from a practical perspective? It's a big ask. Oh, it's a big ask, yeah. In a one sentence? Okay, I can send it to a couple of sentences. <laughs> So I think it's, um, things are changing and the ecosystem is changing and, and how are you able to adapt to it and how can you benefit from that? I think the centerpiece of all of this is you, everybody of you who sits there, and think about where is it that you can lift where you stand and where is it you can um, add value and do something different. Um, as I mentioned before, this is an opportunity that only presents itself in our lifetime one time. So we better not sleep in that hour of glory. This is our time to shine. Thank you. Mario. I said that if you go back, you arrive at home, if you have some contact with the government or people in the government, call the minister that have more influence in your country Many times it's the Minister of Finance. There is no other that I have so power than the Minister of Finance. He asked the Minister of, F of Finance to put in the CERB table the Minister of Education, the uh, uh, Minister of Telecommunication, the Minister of Science and Technology, the Minister for Law and Regulation, and tell to all of them, close in the same room, don't open the door, and tell, take an agreement how to attract investment and speak about each other with you, with the, with the other, uh, understanding how the world is changing in this new technology. I think if you want to do something that has some effective results, the only thing is put all of them in the same room, close the door, take the, the key, put the other person that explains how the world is changing, and they have to find an agreement, because if there is no agreement, there is not complementary in policy. If there is not complementary in these new policy, there is not capability to attract new investment. When you close the door with three ministers, do you need a gun? <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, say, what, what's your thoughts on this? Overwhelmed. I think when you think about this, think about sustainable development. Think about the people and the social well-being of people. Think the, about the well-being of in your environment. Think about your social development. Technology is an enabler. It's not the end, it's a means. Today we have these trends in technology, tomorrow we'll have another one. We should think about the economic impact that we're making to people, and we should not be overwhelmed with how these big companies, they want to drive us. Because at the end of the day, it's their interest. And we see this in the, in the level of chaos we have around the world. Of course, we want to be better countries, we want to be better economies. But let's not forget, this is at the end of the day for the well-being and the best of our own people, not anything else. So that's my message. Great, Jay? I'll keep it really simple, invest in education and have regulations that are very friendly to startups. Uh, if, if you don't, the smart people are going to leave and start their companies elsewhere. Finally, uh, Ross. I get a lot of questions often asked, Ross, it's too hard. Or Ross, this is happening, or com competition. So my view is simple. It's leadership. The three values of my company is learn, lead, and legacy. And we live by that. And what that means is don't wait for governments. Don't wait for somebody. Okay, just get on and do it. Be a leader. Because there's so many organizations just stepping back, waiting to find out. You're gonna, you're gonna fail, you're gonna, maybe you'll make a few bets, you'll lose a few bets, but give it a go. You know, just move, move forward. That's, I really passionately believe that. And those who know me and know my company, the teams, that's what we believe in. Because we believe life is about lifelong learning. 
not about your undergraduate courses. Keep moving on. I've got to keep learning. I'm 55. I've got to learn what blockchain is all about. I've got to learn what digital currency is about. Don't leave it to someone else. I've got to figure this out. You were when you lead, it's about stepping up. <laughs> That's the important one and making a difference. That's what I believe in. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we've got about five and a half minutes left, so I think I want to open up to the floor uh, for some questions. I'm sure there are plenty there. Um, firstly, thank you, all, thank you all, by the way, for your input. I think it's been fascinating. Um, so over to you, to the floor. Have there any questions? Do we have any, sorry, do we have any microphones in the room? microphone. We've got a curly question coming up. Thank you, Haifa. Hey, hi, uh, my name is Radha Krishna. Uh, we are into blockchain technology development works and we do have our own digital currency. So just want to check with you uh, how open the Australian uh, community and Australian government uh, to encourage the digital currencies and the blockchain projects. Can you repeat the question? Uh, if I heard you right, it was about uh, how open is the Australian government towards crypto? Yep. Okay. So very, very interesting. Uh, so I'm involved in the blockchain community, uh, Australia and India. I've just come from a blockchain, the World Blockchain Conclave in India last week, spoke there. Um, so some very interesting developments. The Reserve Bank is um, watching to see how this is, the, the crypto and digital world is panning out. Uh, the top five banks, so that's the Westpac, CBAs, West, uh, and NABs and ANZs, uh, they're watching too because there's a lot of risk around crypto and digital. So what's that left is a lot of entrepreneurs and startups really driving the agenda. And I think this example in Australia is actually happening, is replicated from India. India, the Reserve Bank just said we're not interested in it, but it, it, the push is coming. So I think um, some countries are more ahead. We heard our friend from, I think, was it Moldova uh, earlier today. Uh, it's at different paces, but it's, it's building momentum. Um, there's, it's, it's a big topic. Maybe we can connect afterwards if you'd like. Great. I'd like to comment on blockchain because a lot of people have been talking about it. For context, I first bought Bitcoin in 2013. My partner, Naval, runs the long, longest standing cryptocurrency hedge fund called Metastable Capital. He started it in 2014. We run a company called Coinlist, a cryptocurrency financial services platform, uh, and we have meaningful stakes in some of the most promising tokens. And what I would encourage people here when they're getting approached with blockchain propositions, uh, since there are so many of them and very few of them are credible, ask two questions. Number one, how long have you been involved in the blockchain space? Uh, what you typically see is that when you have an interesting phenomenon, everyone hypes, uh, jumps on the bandwagon on the, and the hype, and they don't really know what they're doing, they're followers. So you wanna look at people who've been involved in this and invested in it for a while. And then number two, you wanna look at people who have true underlying technology. Mm. These should be people who are cryptographers, mathematicians, developing real credible things, not just someone with a blockchain pitch. And I've also seen uh, what the folks at IBM and some of the consulting groups are doing. Uh, they're just trying to package it and sell it and make money and, and use kind of blockchain and the hype to get clients. So I'd be very wary of that. Sure. Okay, any other questions? Okay, well, I appreciate we're getting close to lunch. I'm gonna quickly summarize and then we, we should all have a, have a break and uh, that'll finish the session nicely on time. Um, so just really, I think a recap from this discussion, invest, invest in education. That's the, been the, the key takeout, I think, from the last two panel sessions is invest in education. Okay, I think there's a huge opportunity there, particularly for the emerging market governments, is that there is opportunities there. It's not the end. I think the flexibility around policy was something that obviously there, there's big advantages to be had there. Um, Henrik made, made a final point there around the, center, the centerpiece is you, okay? There, there's plenty of opportunity there, but this is a one-time opportunity, seize it. Uh, from Mario, obviously about consensus. Consensus is needed to be able to formulate decent policies. So again, I think that was another one there. Hussein made a point about social mobility, and I think again, that, that's really important to take that point back. Uh, Jake, again, invest in education, and creating a good startup regulation environment. I think, again, that, that's a really key one, and particularly the fact that we have uh, a parallel session going on over the next couple of days, looking at AIM Startup, 
any emerging market governments, it's worthwhile you know, putting your head in there tomorrow. Um, and then finally, Ross made a point about leadership. Learn, lead, legacy. I think those are really key points to, to take home from this, this session. So I would like to extend my thanks to the panelists for their excellent um, uh, port points and comments that they've been making. So please join me in th thanking them all for their, their kind contribution. And I wish you all a very pleasant lunch. Thank and you. And also a big, big thanks to David for his chairmanship. Thank you very much. Thank you.